count it a blessing to be able to be with you this evening as we, over the next few moments, consider some things from God's Word that will have an eternal consequence in the lives of every one of us who are here this evening. Appreciate so much the reason that has brought us together, and that is to try to encourage one another, and try to uplift one another, and maybe try to say something that's going to uh, be an encouragement to somebody to obey the gospel. There may be somebody here this evening that's never become a Christian. And I just got to tell you, at the very outset, you, my friend, do not know the blessings that you're missing by not being a child of God. And I, I certainly hope that maybe we'll say something this evening that will I encourage you in that, that direction. One night when I was driving home, I just concluded a gospel meeting. It was late at night, and I, I was driving home, hadn't been home for a week, and driving through the darkness and uh, listening to Sirius Radio. And there was a song that came on the radio that sort of arrested my attention. It just, uh, I, I got, it's been recorded by various artists, uh, but I was listening to the singing of this song, and, and not only the title, but, but sometimes even some of the words within that song just, it just caught my attention. And the song was entitled, Nothing I Can Do About It Now. That's a fairly old song. Maybe you're familiar with it, maybe you're not. But uh, some of the stanzas in that song, that just kind of like I say, it, uh, it's kind of haunting. Because in the first stanza of the song, the, the singer says, Regret is just a memory written on my brow, and there's nothing I can do about it now. And then the final stanza included, And I could cry for the time I've wasted, but that's a waste of time and tears. And I know just what I'd change if I went back in time somehow, but there's nothing I can do about it now. And I'm going to tell you something, my friends. When you stop and consider that, I think all of us can look back in our lives and we can say, you know what, I wish I had not done, and you can fill in the blank. I wish I had not made this decision and acted upon it, or I wish I had gone in another direction. We look back upon our lives and we see, you know, things that we wish we could undo, but you know what, there's nothing we can do about it now. And that's the, that's the stark, cold reality of it. We have to live and die with the things that we've done, with the choices that we've made, with the actions that we have taken, and be frank with you, there's nothing we can do about it. We cannot go back and undo the past, and that is a fact. You know, I, I, I just think about, you know, raising my children. And Sue and I have three children. We have 11 grandchildren. But I think of the time that we were raising our three children at home. You know what? I made a lot of mistakes in the rearing of those children. I wish I could go back, but I can't. I wished I had said I'm listening more. I wished I had said I love you more. I wished I had said I understand a little more than I did. Sue and I have been married for more than 50 years. But you know what? I, I tell you what, we eloped. We didn't have a large wedding. It was just she and I and another couple standing before a justice of the peace in Jeffersonville, Indiana. I wish I could go back and have a big wedding, not necessarily for me, but for my wife, so she could have pictures that she could look back upon on that very special day. I regret that, but you know what, ladies and gentlemen? There's nothing I can do about that. I cannot go back and undo the past. And I want to tell you, all of us have to recognize that regrets, regrets are something that we have to live with. We cannot. We cannot go back and undo the past. Now, to illustrate that from the Bible, and I'm not going to be preaching a song, but to illustrate the title of that from the Bible, I want to ask you three questions this evening. And then I'm going to go back to the Scriptures and I'm going to try to answer those questions. And then I'm going to make some applications that I believe are going to be very relevant for each and every one of us. Now, if you're a Bible student, if you spent much time in the Bible, you're going to know the answers to these questions. And uh, if you haven't, probably even some of the answers will be so simple that you will grasp it at the very beginning. But the three questions that I want to ask are these. How did Esau, I'm going back to the Old Testament, 
How did Esau administer his firstborn birthright? Now, I want you to think about that. We're going to go back and develop that just a little bit. This is one of Isaac's sons. How did he, how did he administer his firstborn birthright? Now, the second question that I'm going to address is how many years did Moses live in the promised land when he died? How long was it that he lived in Canaan after leading the children of Israel out of Egyptian captivity? How long did he live in the promised land when he died? And then the third question that I'll ask is when King David died, how old was his firstborn son that he had with Bathsheba? Now those are the three questions I want to ask you. Now you remember what the premise of our study is this evening. There's nothing I can do about it now. So let's begin to answer those questions. Let's go to our first question. How did Esau administer his birthright? Now I want us to think about this. Let's think about the family of Isaac. Isaac had two sons. He had twin sons, Esau and Jacob. Now, Esau would have been the oldest of those twin boys. He would have been born first. And as a result of being born first, he would have received the birthright. Now, what that means is that he would have become the patriarch of that family upon the death of his father. And it would have meant that he would have received twice the inheritance of his brother. You see, if there were two sons, the way, that it was, uh, the way that the inheritance was divided in those days is that it would be broken down into three parts. Three equal parts for two sons. The older son would have received a double portion, two shares. The younger son would have received one share. Now Esau and Jacob were different. Esau was a hunter. He liked to go out in the woods and, and in the forest and he liked to hunt and, and, and eat wild game. His brother, on the other hand, liked to kind of stay around the tent and cook and do other things like that and he was the favorite of his mother. And of course Esau was the favorite of his father. Now we pick up our reading in Genesis chapter 25 and verse 29. Esau had been out hunting. Now Jacob cooked a stew, verse 29 said, and Esau came in from the field and he was weary. And Esau said to Jacob, Please feed me with that same red stew, for I am weary. Therefore his name was called Edom, which is red. And so now he's asking his brother, You know, hey, I, I'm a little bit hungry, and you know that sure smells good, what you've cooked there. Why don't you give me a little bit of that? And Jacob said, Well... You sell me your birthright as of this day. And Esau said, look, I'm about to die, so what is this birthright to me? Man, I'm starving to death. And if I don't get some of that food, I'm just going to keel over and die, so what good is this birthright? So Jacob said, well, swear to me as of this day. So he swore to him and sold his birthright to Jacob. And Jacob gave Esau bread and stew of lentils, and he ate and drank. Now notice, thus he, and went away, thus Esau despised his birthright. Now let's fast forward a little bit. The old man's about to die. Their father is about to die, and so now he's going to give a blessing to each of his sons. And he was going to give to Esau the blessing of the firstborn, Thus the blessing that went with the birthright. But through deception, Jacob is going to receive that blessing. Now we're over in Genesis chapter 27. And we find that Esau or that Jacob had gone in and deceived his father, and the father blessed him. Now look at verse 33. Then Esau, uh, then Isaac trembled exceedingly and said, Who? Where is the one who hunted game and brought it to me? I ate all of it before you came, and I have blessed him, that is your brother Jacob. And indeed he shall be blessed. When Esau heard the words of his father, he cried with an exceeding great and bitter cry, and said to his father, Bless me, me also, O my father. But he said, Your brother came with deceit and has taken away your blessing. 
Now remember the question, ladies and gentlemen, how did Esau administer his birthright? Well, I'm going to tell you how he administered his birthright. He gave it up. Did he regret it? You betcha he regretted it. Did he wish he could go back and undo what he did? Yes, he wished he could go back and undo what he did. But you know, the Hebrew writer reminds us in Hebrews 12 and verse 17 that Esau found no place for repentance, though he sought it diligently with tears. All the tears this man could cry, all of the pleading this man could give to his father, all of the begging, all of the entreaty, it went for nothing. Because you know, my friends, there was nothing he could do about it. He sold the birthright. Now he's going to have to live with that for the rest of his life. Don't you see what I'm telling you? Choices that you make, decisions that you make, words that you utter. These things are going to be hanging out there for the rest of your life. And you know what? There's nothing you can do about it. Question two. And that involves Moses. How many years did Moses live in the promised land? After leading the children of Israel out of Egyptian captivity. You know, ladies and gentlemen, Moses was the hand-picked leader for Israel. God had heard the cries of his people. They had been in Egyptian bondage for... 400 years. Now God is going to raise up Moses, and Moses is going to lead the children of Israel out of bondage. And I, I tell you what, I believe the finest hour in Moses' life is found in Exodus chapter 12 and verse 31, when Pharaoh gives up. After the plagues, Pharaoh says, No, Moss, I'm done. Take them. Take the children of Israel out. Take them to the land. Let them go out in the wilderness. Let them worship God as they see fit. Just go ahead. Like I say, that was the finest hour. And you know what should have been? What should have been a two or three or four week journey ended up being 40 years. The children of Israel wandered in the wilderness toward the promised land because of their murmuring and because of their unbelief. And now they're on the verge after 40 years of entering the promised land. Old man Moses. Old man Moses had led them all of that time and he put up with their bickering and he put up with their moaning and their groaning and their complaining. And now they are about to enter the promised land. All of the years of wandering now are coming to a close. And just before they enter into the land, there's an incident that occurs in a place called Kadesh. The, the, the Israelites are murmuring again. They're complaining again. We don't have any water. Moses, we don't have water for ourselves, for our children, or for our flocks, our livestock. We need some water. Talk to God about it. And Moses talks to God about it. And here's what God says to Moses in, Gen in Numbers chapter 20 in verse 8. He says, take the rod. It's that rod he'd been, he'd been walking with. You, you take your rod. You and your brother Aaron gather the congregation together. Speak to the rock before their eyes. And it will yield its water. Thus you shall bring water for them out of the rock, and give drink to the congregation and their animals. God said, you want some water? Here's how you do it. Go, there's a rock over here. You go over and say something to that rock. You go over and you speak to that rock, and you know what that rock will do? It'll give water. So Moses, in verse 9 of, of Numbers 20, Moses took the rod from before the Lord as he commanded. And Moses and Aaron gathered the assembly together before the rock, and he said to them, Hear now, you rebels. Must we bring water for you out of this rock? Moses lifted his hand, and he struck the rock twice. Wait a minute. God said, Speak to the rock. Moses took that big stick, and he smacked that rock twice. And you know what happened? Well, water came out abundantly, and the congregation and their animals drank. Well, somebody said, Well, you know what, J.O.? I don't see a real big deal here. I, I don't see a big deal at all. 
God said, speak to the rock. Well, Moses, he spoke to the congregation and struck the rock. And after all, they got water. It's no big deal, right? Wrong. Because I'm going to tell you something. In answer to the question, how long did Moses live in the promised land that he spent 40 years walking toward? He didn't spend a day there. The closest he got to, was to Mount Nebo, and he got to look at the promised land. Because you did not believe me, God said in Numbers 20 and verse 12, to hallow me in the eyes of the children of Israel, therefore you shall not bring this assembly into the land. You can't go in, Moses. This is the land in, De in Deuteronomy chapter 34 and verse 4. He allowed him to stand up there and look at it, and God said, this is the land. Now you take a look at it. This is what I'm going to give. I'll give it to your descendants. I have caused you to see it with your eyes, but you shall not cross over there. I wonder how he felt at this time. I wonder now if he wished he could have controlled his temper a little bit better. I wonder now if he wished he could go back and undo some of the things that happened at Kadesh. But you know, ladies and gentlemen, I may not know what he thought, but I know what he was not allowed to do, and that's go into the promised land, and there was nothing he could do about it. There was absolutely nothing. He, could, he couldn't go back and unstrike the rock. You see what I'm telling you? You see, there's biblical precedence for what we're talking about here this evening. You cannot undo the decisions that you've made, the choices that you've acted upon, the words that you've said, the thoughts that you've had, your interaction with us, you can't undo it. It is there. Third question involved David, king of Israel. When David died, how old was his firstborn son with Bathsheba? In order to address this, we've got to go to 2 Samuel chapter 11. In 2 Samuel chapter 11, and I think all of us, including some of the children here, you study about this in Bible class. In, in 2 Samuel chapter 11, we find the Israelites, the, the army of Israel, out doing battle with the Philistines. David, king, is not out there with them doing battle. He's back in Jerusalem. And I like to tell people what David here is on a little R&R, a &R, little rest and relaxation. And we pick up our reading in, in uh, 2 Samuel 11 and verse 2. Then it happened one evening that David arose from his bed. And he walked on the roof of the king's house, and from the roof he saw a woman bathing, and the woman was beautiful to behold. And so David sent and inquired about the woman. And someone said, Is this not Bathsheba, the daughter of Elam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? And David said, Who, who is that beautiful? Who is that down there? Well, who is that woman down there taking a bath? And I'm looking, she's a beautiful woman. I, I'd like to know who she is. I wonder about that question, and I don't know if you've ever wondered about it or not. Surely, David could have known who this woman was. David had an elite group of men called his mighty men. And David would have interacted with these mighty men on a regular basis, and guess what? Uriah, the, the husband of, of Bathsheba, was one of his mighty men. But I'll go one further. I, I, I'll do you one better. David had an advisor. And that advisor, you, you, know, you, you know, all great leaders have men that give them advice, have men that counsel them. David had an advisor, had a counselor, and the Bible says this man's counsel was so good that it was almost as if it were the words of God himself. That man's name was Ahithophel. And you know what? Uh, I've got to tell you something. This advisor was the grandfather of Bathsheba. And David said, I wonder who that is. David brought this woman to his bed and committed adultery with her, then had her husband killed when he found out that she was pregnant and he was trying to cover this up for a year. 
And you know what? David, after, after, uh, after Uriah is dead, David and Bathsheba, they marry. The child that was conceived was born. But guess what? That child got sick. And we read over in, second, in Samuel chapter 12. The Bible says in verse 16 of 2 Samuel 12, when that child got sick, David therefore pleaded with God for the child. And David fasted and went in and lay all night on the ground. Here is a father's heart was broken. That child is sick. That child may die. What does he do? He prays to God about it. He goes in and he lays on the ground. He was even unable to eat in verse 17. He was fasting. His appetite had left him. Look at verse 18. Then on the seventh day it came to pass that the child died. You know what I find out, ladies and gentlemen? I find out that David did not, or that uh, David did not have that child to live beyond infancy. How old was the firstborn when, uh, when David died? You know, David outlived his son. Even though he prayed to God to spare the child, David was told by Nathan. You know what, because of the sin that you had committed, that, that the sword shall never depart from your house. Because you've done this deed and given great occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme, the child also who is born to you shall surely die. And you know what? It didn't matter how many times David prayed. It didn't matter how many times he cried. He could not go back and undo what he did that caused the death of that child. Don't you see what I'm talking to you about this evening, ladies and gentlemen? Regret is something that is hard for us to bear. It was with David, it was with Moses, and it was with Esau. But as it, is, as it was with those men, we can make decisions that we cannot undo, and we've got to live with them. It's like cracked eggs. You cannot uncrack an egg. It's a heavy burden to bear. I think of cases that we haven't even examined this evening. I think of the Apostle Peter. When Peter denied the Lord three times, exactly like the Lord said he's going to do, you're going to deny me three times before the rooster crows. And you know, Peter did exactly that. And Luke tells us in Luke chapter 22, when Peter denied the Lord and he heard the the rooster crow, he looked across the courtyard and caught the eyes of Jesus looking at him. And what does the Bible say? Peter went out and wept bitterly. I wonder how he felt. He couldn't undo that. The same with Samson. When Samson finally revealed the source of his strength and the Philistines came in and put out his eyes and bound him and put him in a, in a grinder's prison. And he was grinding meal in that prison. I wonder how many times he regretted as he ground that meal, in that, uh, that meal in the prison. How many times did he regret that? But you know what? There wasn't anything he could do about it. And like David, David said in reference to Bathsheba, you know, my sin is ever before me. You know, this is a serious matter. You know, when, we, when, when gospel preachers talk to you and elders counsel you, and people who love you talk to you about the life that you're living, they, they're trying to reach you so that you will not make decisions that you cannot undo. You know, a, a question was asked to several people, and I've got three answers to that question, but several people will ask the question, what is the thing that you regret most? woman by the name of Roberta said, I'd choose to undo the moment I hung up the phone mad at my mom and decided not to talk to her for a long time and stop taking calls that showed her number. Two weeks later, she passed away and I didn't get the chance to say goodbye due to my stupid pride. Roberta has to live with that from now on. She can't go back and undo it. She can't now take phone calls from her mother that's lying in the graveyard somewhere. Morgan said, my regret is refusing to save my marriage. 
I walked away from my first love and I never found the happiness I looked for. Can't go back and undo it. Amber said, I'd say it's not answering my dad's calls. He was just lonely. He just wanted to talk. But I was too busy. You see, ladies and gentlemen, decisions that are made cannot be undone. We cannot go back and undo the choices that we've made and the decisions that we've acted upon. Now let's get specific about this. Let's get specific about this. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to speak frank to you this evening because this is a serious matter. What about those who have decided that they're going to commit adultery in the marriage relationship they happen to be in? You know, the Bible says in Proverbs 6, verses 27 and 28, that a man cannot take fire to his bosom without being burned. He's talking about adultery here. And adultery is the only reason that a man or a woman has the right to put away a spouse upon this earth. That's the only reason. And you know what happens? What happens very early in the marriage in a marriage is the couple seems to act like, you know, they're still single. And very often early in a marriage, adultery is committed. I have counseled so many young people who come into my office and say, and I can tell, I can tell when they come in what the problem is. Couple comes in and and, 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 and he's sitting there with his head all down like this, like he's ashamed to look at you, and she's sitting over here, and her face is all red, and, and her eyes are red from all night crying. And they'll come in and they'll confess that adultery has been in that marriage. Well, what are you going to do about it? You can't go back and undo it. Sometimes it ends in divorce. Sometimes a person that's not involved in sin, puts the other one away, and they have a scriptural right to do that. And it breaks up a marriage, it breaks up a home, it frustrates children. All because somebody made a decision that now they regret. But somebody said, well, you know what, J.R.? Sometimes that happens and they don't divorce. They get together and they, they make that marriage good again. And yes, that happens. I held a funeral for a man. He and his wife had been married 57 years. And we worshiped with him in another state. And, and, and we, I'm sitting there with the widow, and we're talking about the funeral and how things are going to be conducted. And, and she just broken hearted over the loss of her spouse. But she reaches across the table and takes hold of my hand, and she said, Brother J.R., there's something I need to say to you. I said, well, what is it? And she said, in our first year of marriage, he committed adultery with my friend. I'm telling you, ladies and gentlemen, I was broken hearted. Here is a couple, yes, they stayed together. Yes, they together raised a daughter. Yes, they together stayed in the church. Yes. But after 57 years, that scar was still there. And she never forgot it. Did she forgive him? I'm sure she did. But it still hurt her. Don't you see? If you adulterate your relationship, don't you see what happens? You have done something that cannot be undone and the scars remain forever. That's right. You know, we tell people, you better be careful about the decisions that you're making because you cannot undo those decisions. And this is true about viewing pornography. We talked about it last evening. This is something you cannot undo. You know, I tell you what, my friends, here's the reality of it. You know, Jesus said in Matthew 5 and verse 28, if you look upon a woman to lust after her, you've committed adultery with her in your heart. What he's telling you is you have committed sin. It is not something that is innocent. But beyond that, let me tell you something. Let me tell you what the reality of this is. Each time one views pornography, he is rewiring his brain. 
He is burning images in that brain that will remain for the rest of his life. It changes the way that he has a relationship with his wife. It changes the way that he views the marriage bed. It changes everything. It's not an innocent thing. And I've known of families that have been torn asunder simply because of that sin. It's not an innocent thing. If a man lusts upon a woman, looks upon a woman to lust after her, he's sinned against his wife, he's sinned against the one to, that he's looking at, and he's sinned against God. It's high time that men had the same fiber that Job had. And Job said in Job 31 and verse 1, I will make a covenant with my eyes that I will not look upon a strange woman. You do that and I'll tell you what. You're sinning against God and you're doing something that you cannot undo. And that's true with anger. Look what happened to Moses in Numbers chapter 20 and verse 12. Moses struck the rock. God said speak to the rock, but out of a sense of frustration, a sense of anger, he struck that rock. And you know what? He couldn't go back and undo that. And the proverb writer reminds us that if we can control our spirit, we're better than a man who conquers a city. You say, well, I, you know what, J.R., I, yeah, I got a little temper problem. It's not anything like, mo really? What about the time you lost your temper? And You know, I, I, I've known this in families. You know, dad gets all upset. Maybe something's going on bad in the family, and, and, and he's got an issue with the son, and, and, and just backhands that child across the room. That little fellow just goes crawl, rolling across the room with his face swollen up and red. And dad feels real bad about that, don't you, dad? You feel real guilty about that. And so you pick that little fellow up and you set him on your lap and you tell him, son, I'm so sorry. Daddy just lost his temper. And you know what that little boy will do? He'll throw his arms around you and he will love you. And he'll say to you, that's all right, dad, but I'm going to tell you something. That's something that he will never forget. I'll never forget the time that my dad backhanded me across the room. Or we say something to our wife in anger, or to our children in anger, or to a neighbor in anger. You know, as a matter of fact, anger has gotten to be such a problem, they even designate it in certain ways. There's road rage. Isn't that amazing? You know what? You may do something in a moment of anger that you cannot go back and undo. You cannot remove that slap. You cannot remove what you did to your neighbor or to what you did to the driver or what you said to your wife, or to your husband. These things are said, and you're going to have to live with it, because you can't go back and undo it. And that's true of men who spend all of their time working and neglecting their families. And as the wise man said in Ecclesiastes 2, you're just going to die and leave it to somebody else. You know, just like the rich farmer in Luke chapter 12 and verse 20, this night your soul will be required of you. Now whose will these things be that you have provided? You know what? It, 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 it's, a, it's a crime. Now don't misunderstand me. I, I think men ought to have good work ethics. I really do. I think we ought to be taking care of our own. First Timothy 5 and verse 8. And if we don't do that, we've denied the faith worse than an unbeliever. But at the same time, we need to recognize that if we have children and we have a family at home, we are primarily, ladies and gentlemen, we are primarily men, fathers of those children. I, I think back with Joshua. You, 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 you remember what Joshua said in Joshua 24 and verse 15, As for me and my house, I'm going to talk about this more in a moment, we will serve the Lord. Joshua was a great military leader. He was a great judge in Israel, but his primary goal in life was to be a father to his children. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. You know what? You remember that, remember that song, The Cat's in the Cradle? Remember how that little boy wanted some time with his dad and his dad was too busy? Dad, let's, let's, uh, can you toss the ball? No, I, I'd like to, son, but I got some things I got to do. On and on and on, that little boy grew up without a relationship to his father. You cannot go back and undo that. And that's 
true if we neglect the training of our children. Proverbs 22 and verse 6, we noted it last evening. Raise a child, train up a child in the way that he should go, and when he's old, he'll not depart from it. Training takes some effort. Training doesn't mean that we just tell them what to do. Training doesn't mean that we just drag them to church services. Training doesn't mean that we make sure on Saturday night before Sunday morning they've got their Bible lesson. Training means that we raise them to know and to love the Lord. We, 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 we point them the way, to, the way to Christ. And we show them the way to Christ by the way that we live. From childhood, Paul said to Timothy, he knew the Holy Scriptures. Where did he know them? He knew them from his mother and his grandmother. Eunice and Lois taught that young man. And they had genuine faith, Paul said in 2 Timothy 1 and verse 5. And Paul said, I recognize that genuine faith is also in you. Now, if you neglect that, it's not going to do you a bit of good to run off to the preacher and ask the preacher to talk to your child. If you neglect doing that, it's not going to do any good to go to the elders and beg the elders to do something with that child. If we neglect that opportunity and we waste that opportunity, there's nothing we can do to regain it. Let me say something to young people here. This idea the social media has presented to you that you can just put anything online and you don't have anything to worry about. You Snapchat, you know, you put it on there and it'll go away in two or three or four seconds. Hey, don't believe that for a minute. It's somewhere in cyberspace. The things that you send, the pictures that you send, you know, there's even something that's referred to as sexting, inappropriate pictures that young girls are taking and sending to their boyfriends. I'm going to tell you something. You will live to regret that. That will come back on you one day, and you will be so ashamed. The Bible says in Proverbs 13 and verse 16, A fool lays open his folly. Don't do it. Because you cannot go back and undo what you've done. In a one night stand, surrendering yourself to someone that you believe is going to love you for the rest of your life. You know, Paul says to flee sexual immorality in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. And I'm not going to be vivid, I'm not going to be risque, and I'm not going to say anything that's going to cause someone to feel the need to blush this evening, but let me say to you that if you involve yourself, young people, in sexual immorality, if you give away your virginity, you cannot reclaim it. It's gone. And God didn't intend for you to do that. He intended for you to save yourself for your husband or young men, you save yourself for your wife. Do not do it. You have sinned against your own body, Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. You've sinned against the person with whom you had the affair. You've sinned against God and you've sinned against your own body. You cannot go back and reclaim what you've given away. There's nothing you can do about it. And that includes having an abortion. Jeremiah was told by God that I knew you before you were formed in your mother's womb. The psalmist says we're fearfully and wonderfully made. We're made in the image of God. And let me tell you something, that small little embryo, that small little fetus that's growing, and by the way, I'm just using the medical terms today, God says that's a baby. God says that's a human life that's growing in the womb of that woman. And if you rip it out, if it is torn from your body, a murder has been committed even though it's, it's sanctioned by the land. Oh, I understand that. But you know what? You're making a decision or a decision has been made that you cannot undo. And a year from now, ten years from now, you're going to think that little girl would have been ten years old now. I wonder what she would have looked like. Oh, I wished I hadn't done that. But you know what? The decision was made. And you cannot go back and undo that. There's none of these that can be undone. So what are some takeaways? What do we learn from this? 
You say, Jr., you, 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 this is so depressing. I, I'm going to go home. I, I'm just going to think about all the things that I've done that I wish. I, I don't want to leave you on a down note. I don't. I don't want to leave you on a downer. I, I, let, let, let's, 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 let's think about some takeaways from this. What is it that we can learn? What would be some applications for us today? Maybe you've made some decisions. Maybe you've done some things that you totally regret. You, you wish that you could go back and undo them, but you can't. Then I'll say to you, seek right now the forgiveness of God. Don't live another second with regret. Lay it before the Lord. If we confess our sins, He, God, is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Please, lay it at the cross of Christ tonight. Don't live with guilt another moment. This is something that you can do. That's, what you did does not have to define you. Now, I'm going to tell you, I'll just be honest as I can be with you. I was not raised by Christian parents. Many of you realize that my father just died. Dad was 96 years old. And I tell you, he lived 96 years upon this earth and died without Christ. That hurts me to even say it tonight. And I, I wasn't raised by Christian parents. And as I was growing up, I did some things that were horrible and horrific, and I wish I could go back and undo them, but I can't. I'll tell you what I did do. I sought the Lord's forgiveness. Create within me a clean heart. And that's all that we can do. Seek the Lord's forgiveness. But another takeaway from this is leave your past behind. And as Paul said, press on to the goal of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Press on, leave it behind. I can't go back and undo those things. But you know what? I'm not going to wallow in those. I'm not going to relive those. I'm not going to let those to follow me into the future that I have. I'm not going to do that. And you needn't do it either. Seek the Lord's forgiveness and be like the Apostle Paul. He spent years trying to destroy the church. And once he became a Christian, you know, Paul said, I can't undo that. But the one thing that I can do is forget the past and press on to the goal. Don't wallow in your guilt. Forgive yourself and move on. And then begin to make better choices. You know, that's why the, proper, that's why the Ecclesiastes writer in chapter 12 and verse 1 says, Remember your Creator in the days of your youth. Seek the Lord now before you make some of those decisions. Seek the Lord now before you make choices that you've got to live with for the rest of your life. Be like Joshua. As for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. That's what's going to define my family. Make, begin making better choices. Be careful how you live. You know, as the, as the writer of, uh, of Ephesians says, as Paul says in Ephesians 5, verses 15 and 16, you know, circumspectly because the days are evil. Be careful how you live. Make better choices. And then finally, a takeaway that we have is don't blame God. Don't blame God for the consequences that you experience over the decisions that you've made. It's not God's fault. If you sow to the flesh, you'll reap corruption, Paul says in, in Galatians 6. Hosea says in Hosea 6 and verse 7, if you sow the wind, you will reap the whirlwind. And as the rich man was told in Luke chapter 16, son, remember in your lifetime what you had, what you did, and that's the way that it is. Maybe you've made some choices that wreck your health. Don't blame God. Maybe you've made some choices that destroy your family. Don't blame God. Because you need to remember who it was that struck the match that burned down the house. There's nothing I can do about the past. But I tell you what is so beautiful about Christ and about the gospel that it provides me with a new beginning. If anyone is in Christ, he or she is a new creation 
in Christ. You see, you can stop right now. The life of sin that has defined you up to this point in time, the life of unhappiness that has haunted you up to this point in time, and you can seek a new relationship with the Lord. He died, shed his blood so that you could have that relationship. Yeah, you might have made some choices that you look back upon with regret that you cannot undo. But in a moment, we're going to stand and sing an invitation song that's going to give you the opportunity to make a choice that you will never regret, either in this life or in the life to come. If you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, repent of your sins, turn from them. Confess that faith this evening. Be baptized in water for the remission of your sins. And in doing that, you reach the saving blood of Jesus and be raised to walk in newness of life. Maybe, maybe, Christian friend, you just need to come home. And as John said in 1 John 1 and verse 9, just confess your sins. And we'll, we'll pray with you. We'll pray for you. We'll help you in every kind of way. Serve the Lord with passion and commitment. If you're subject to the invitation, we urge you to come. Come right now as together we stand as we sing.